Anyone who thinks they're following Carl Jung, all type tests eventually go in the bin. It is a complete fiction to presume that your unconscious has any type at all. The downside of your type, mm. it's, and I'll use the expression, it's the arse end of you. The maladaptations that you don't normally see about your own type because you're so busy being that type. There should be a naturalistic approach to type. For those who are familiar with typology, mm. if, if you work clinically, then you know you, you, you have to set aside everything. You really, really do, and, and start mm. to work with the reality of people. Mm. Well, most, most of our work, typologically speaking, is based on observation, mm. principally, isn't it? it? Is, I mean, yeah. sometimes we, we'll use the Myers-Briggs to mm. uh, confirm what we suspect as, mm. as being a particular profile, but more often than not, it's based on an yeah. observation yeah. and um, that really hones your skills. It does, well. it does. And that links back to the hypnotherapy skills. Does, uh, yeah. you know, uh, clinical skills are all about observation and it's not just extrinsic, it's intrinsic observation where, where you watch yourself, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, so the type has got, has got its uses, but it's got its limitations. Mm. I, I say we, I, I'll speak for myself and Paul obviously uh, would uh, probably say a similar thing, but yeah. um, I would tend to use uh, a test like the Myers-Briggs only to validate or to confirm or offer a different perspective yeah. to an observation that I've made. Definitely, yeah. Uh, if it was just one person I was working with. If we were working with couples, and when we, we did work with couples and families, we'd probably both be present, wouldn't we? Yes. You know, uh, yeah. Because it balances the energy it does, out. Yeah. Um, then uh, typology is definitely very, very useful mm. to explain the superficialities of a relationship to the people who are in that relationship. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. At, at, that, at that level, it, it is important. It is important because it might calm things sufficiently or take the heat out of things sufficiently to allow you to do deeper work. Yeah. If, if people are so, you know, if horns are locked and they're, they're so entrenched in reacting to one another in a particular way, then introducing the idea of different types and different ways of, of modeling the, wor the world becomes extremely useful. So it's a very good starting place. It is. It, it, it is a good starting place. Um, there's that lady uh, who, comment, who commented on YouTube, James, the other day, which um, mm. I, I thought was really interesting. And I, yeah, I, do, you I, to, do you want me to read it out for the audience? Yeah, I'll just say that I asked her permission if we could use it, and she's given the okay on that, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah, so, so she says, um, it took me a good year to understand that if I buy too much into my type, I will lock myself up in an idea about who I am and therefore stop progressing. The more I was in my type, the less I was in myself. Not so difficult when it turns out you're an INTJ and the whole internet tells you how rare and special you are. Your yes. type is not a destination, it's a road sign. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Very good way of pushing it. That, that, that struck me mm. as being an excellent summary, really, of uh, the, the, the problems of, of uh, typism, if you like, which yes. I, I refer to the, uh, <clears throat> the tendency to overuse typology and have it as a lens to see everything um it's got some traction in in the sense that you can certainly persuade people that it's a useful thing to do to see everybody in those terms um commercially the myers-briggs and other tests are based on being able to suggest to people that that it's useful in that way and it's universally applicable however typology in the clinic is different and I've also heard recently some people come out on YouTube, I can't remember that the chap who did it, um, suggest that the Myers-Briggs, for example, is never used clinically anymore. It's always Big Five. Well, some people will use Big Five and others won't. And that will be a matter of experience. Some people will, will be familiar with both and decide, say, on Big Five and others the other way around. Um, personally, I don't find Big Five to be any use whatsoever. I have no use for it. Mm. So, sorry mm. for me. Uh, and that's not a knee jerk response. There just simply is nothing in there for me at all. It, it doesn't fit with the overall model that I've got. Myers Briggs does, despite its limitations. I'm aware of its limitations, mm. but it's so clear with respect to its limitations, it's actually helpful. If its limitations were more vague, it'd be harder to see what they were. 
and then how they were affecting uh, me overall in terms of, the, of how the rest of me functions clinically. So I'm quite happy with its limitations because they're instructive in, in and of themselves. Now, the thing about um, type, the first thing is that Jung they never used type tests. So if you're a Jungian, by orientation, inclination, or intended goal in your life, whatever that might be, what you're essentially saying to yourself is that you're going to give up type tests. Otherwise, you're not following Jung. So anyone who thinks they're following Carl Jung, all type tests eventually go in the bin, because that's what he said. Then if you want to look at uh, the way that the type tests have evolved, it's best to follow mm. a developmental line. So go back to one of the early ones first. And that will be the Gray Wheelwright test. Um, three Jungian analysts, remember um, Briggs and Myers, they were not Jungian analysts. These are three Jungian analysts who used Jung's model clinically. It's a simpler model than the Myers-Briggs and perhaps less precise, and it's been criticized for that. But I would see that as an advantage. If you're familiar with Jung's actual model, you don't want to be too precise, it becomes too tight. So anyway, I, I have a look at the gray wheel, right? Then if you want something that's nice and tight and structured, just take the Myers-Briggs as it presents. Although it has changed, the Myers-Briggs in the 80s and the 90s is different to the Myers-Briggs now. Mm. The tertiary function, in the uh, 80s and 90s was in the opposite attitude to the dominant function. We seem to have reversed that round now. Mm. That might be just for the sake of um, making it fit nicely. So in the case of an INTP then, your so-called opposite ESFJ is all the reverse or the mirror image of that. And this is where I, I, and I think Pauline would agree on this, uh, have an issue with it clinically because it's, it's just nice and neat and it actually creates a fiction about what you're going to meet in the real world. Well, I think um, just coming back to that lady's question, um, it can almost, if you're not careful, it can appeal to your own narcissism, as in, you know, if you're an INTJ, then you, you're a rare type, and that makes you special in some way, and that vast in, it, in itself is trapping. It is. Um, I think it's probably most useful to look at the downside of your own type the backside mm. of it yeah. then you'll learn something yeah. i mean everyone wants to be told something nice about themselves don't they, they do. um, and that's why people turn to horoscopes and and such things but it's not really very instructive because you're almost kind of know already what it means to be you mm. to be your own particular type so mm. i think particularly in couples therapy mm. it's the backside of it that's likely to cause it the most friction and the it most is. trouble between people yeah it is absolutely and there's um there's this fiction which has arisen out of the type test and it's carried over and it's now part of pop psychology broadly to do with Jungian typology that uh, your unconscious mind is somehow the reverse of your conscious mm. choice or adaptation of types. So in my case, if um, and I score generally as an INTP, sometimes an ENTP, yes. and there have been other variations, but generally INTP yeah. fits. That would suggest, according to this received wisdom, that ESFJ is my unconscious. And this is believed. And that somehow ESFJ is my shadow. And ESFJ is my anima. And ESFJ is everything that my ego, my ego consciousness is not. Because that's what mm. it says. Mm. This is a massive, massive problem. If you start to work with people in depth. And if, if you're psychodynamically informed, you'll, you'll see through it straight away. It is a complete fiction to presume that your unconscious has any type at all. Consciousness is where type lives. Mm. So if I'm an INTP, and let's just assume that I am uh, for now, that describes the attitude of consciousness. The unconscious in depth has, as I say, absolutely no type, but you go through a layer, right? The first thing you hit when you go into the unconscious is the mirror image of your type, right? And that manifests at its immediate first point of impact or collision, if you like, as was what Pauline was saying before, yeah. which is the downside of your type. Mm. It's, and I'll use the expression, it's the arse end of you. 
the maladaptations that you don't normally see about your own type because you're so busy being that type. But other people will see it. And you can say, in effect, that that's part of your shadow in, in the broadest sense of definition, that it's the back end of your type. Mm. Then what you're going to meet are at a periphery of consciousness, a little bit further, a little bit deeper than that, but it's still within that, that broad field. Because remember, the, 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 the shadow isn't completely unconscious. It is also partially conscious and it's putting you under pressure to be conscious all the time. So there is some awareness of the background type dynamics that are going on of those preferences, as they're called, that you choose not to use. The next thing you're going, you get, you're going to meet are, are the other functions. But this is literally like a reflection of your ego, of your ego con uh, complex, the, the nuclear complex of consciousness. Just the things that you haven't fully integrated, but they're still there within potential. Then, as I say, you, you go down deeper. And as you go down deeper, what you're going to encounter there are the potential for all types in an undifferentiated form, including the ones that you use. They're just there. Then you get deeper still and they vanish completely. They're gone. And by the time you get down to the level of instinct, which is the lowest level of potential consciousness that you can access before you do literally cross the psychoid boundary and into the metabolism of your physicality, right? But well, if I get down to instinct, there's no type at all. It simply does not exist, not even in the form of an image. And I'll explain why that's, that's important in a moment. But if we can just go down to that level, the level of instinct, all types and no types, nothing undifferentiated. If, if you put yourself now in the position of being your own unconscious mind and you're looking out towards the ego, your ego consciousness, and you want to communicate with that, how are you going to do it? Well, there's, there's only one way that you're going to do that, and that, that is to project something. So this is an internal projection. By projection here, I mean the transmission of energy and information towards consciousness. Well, how are you going to make sure it becomes conscious? Well, you have to put it in a form that the ego in its present state can understand and receive. There's no point sending a signal if the recipient doesn't hear it, doesn't see it, doesn't feel it or whatever. Now, with respect to the ego, this is either going to be in the form of, say, of a sensory perception, usually an image, or it's going to be in the form of an affect, an emotion, or both, some combination of both. So there you are, the unconscious. You have this very, very big database which bottoms out in the genome, and part of your role is to inform the, 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 the conscious personality of what it needs to do. But as you project that out, it's going to pass through various layers of filtration and through various layers of transformation. Mm. So by the time it hits consciousness, it appears as some kind of image that, you, that consciousness can potentially, potentially understand. But not only that, it will appear in the form of type that consciousness is, is adjusted to, to be most efficiently integrated. If it comes in with some of the, the mirror image forms of un, uh, undeveloped type, still within the potential of the ego to develop, then it will appear in those forms. But it, it doesn't originate in that way. So what I'm, what I'm saying is your shadow does not have a literal type. It may adopt it. Your, your so-called animus or anima, the relating functions and factors in the psyche, does not have a type but it may adopt it in order to communicate with you. That's quite different from saying the two are the same thing. When you look in then from consciousness, there's a tendency first to look at it from the point of view of your ego. Therefore, the INTP will see things as an INTP sees them. Now, the initial way then an INTP in this, exa this example would experience the, the unconscious is through that filtration and transformation process. But if they're at all bright or switched on, then they will understand that they can begin to see things that don't fit with the normal attitude of consciousness. And at that point, those functions which the INCP does not normally use, their tertiary and inferior functions, in this case sensing and feeling, will start to take on and filter the signals that are coming from the unconscious in an effort to get the ego to broaden its perceptions and understandings. It also gives more options to the unconscious. 
Because if you have to narrow something down into a zip file, which has INTP written all over it, and then you mm. propel that out and hope that it gets mm. open, downloaded and, and read properly, well, it might not be because there might be things that need to go in that zip file that don't suit that particular attitude of consciousness. And that's why you get the affect, the emotion powering through because the emotion tends to blow away things that, that need blowing away. It has a, a specific force attached to it. And the INTP will experience that as being sensing or feeling perhaps, because it's so low down that it hits those functions first as it approaches consciousness and then it blows through finally. And the INTP wakes up and has a, has a thought about it, which then makes it valid with respect to the ego. But of course, it's still one-sided and it needs to develop further. So it needs to develop these other functions. But in developing those functions, all you're really doing is giving the unconscious more uh, options to communicate with you. But when you get down really deep in depth, there is no typology. And if you start to impose your typology, whatever that is, or your understanding of typology, on the unconscious's natural structures, you're going to generate fictions. And you're also going to generate imbalances. You're going to upset instincts. You're going to do all of these things because it does not want to be interpreted in that way. And this is the point about hypnotherapy that we were, we were mentioning earlier to get real rapport with your psyche. You have to say, tell me on your terms and I will listen. Please be open. Don't say I'm an INTP. This is how I'm going to look at my unconscious because you're not going to get the message. You know, you're going to extend the time that you're suffering. You're going to extend the time that you have to work. You're going to create more work for yourself. If you simply develop the, uh, the functions that you don't habitually use, you'll get a little bit further, but you won't get completely there. If you set typology aside utterly and say to the psyche, I'm open to receive the message, you will get the message. Um, a long time ago, um, 30 plus years ago, if, if we were working with older people, who were older even than us now. So uh, when, when they were young, the British Empire was still around. Then one of the useful metaphors for them would be, okay, uh, Mr. So or Sir, whoever you were, when you worked out, out in the colonies and you wanted to talk to someone who didn't speak English, what would you do? Would you go out and shout at them and talk loudly in English in the hope that they would understand you? Surely you would know that that wouldn't work. You have to be quiet and you have to listen. And you have to learn. Then the locals will talk to you. And it's the same with the psyche. Don't talk loudly in the language of consciousness. Don't talk loudly in the language of typology. Ask it how it wants to communicate with you. Then you will get the message. Yes, you do have to interpret that. And that's an active process. But you must be open to it and do not interpret it in, in terms of typology because you're just going to slow yourself down. And we were saying the same with mm. creativity as well. Yes, Paul, we? yes, you was. Um, it, it was a, a comment, I think, that you made, James, um, in one of our previous podcasts about creativity, and you were asking me, did I um, use my animus, my INTP animus, to, to create, to draw, to paint? Um, and I guess I've given quite a lot of thought to that since you asked the question. Uh, and I'd have to say no, because... When I think about how I actually do it, I'm definitely employing my ego, my sensing and my, my feeling. And the creativity is, is, does appear to be independent of that. It seems to be something else that maybe influences the overall outcome of the, the, the shape or the, the form that the piece of work takes. But it's not decisive in terms of, um, uh, of how I create something technically it's definitely my, my ego that's in, in charge of that process so um again you've got to be careful even with that too haven't you yeah, I, I, assuming I, I, that I, I, i'd agree actually that, yeah. that, that when i um i access my particular state yeah. for, for writing yeah. and i get overwhelmed with emotion well that's not my sfj anima because that just doesn't exist uh, what mm. that is, is an INTP ego being blown away by emotion that's powering through from the psyche as a whole, you know, along the ego self axis. And uh, I mean, because if, if my ESFJ animal was handling that, I wouldn't get upset because surely by typological theory, an ESFJ 
structure would be able to handle these forces better than, than uh, an INTP. So if I was using my anima in a typological sense, then the problem wouldn't emerge, but it mm -hmm. does, mm -hmm. which shows that by the time it hits consciousness, it's doing so in the raw. And uh, because it's so wide and so powerful, uh, very often, I simply can't adjust to it. I just have to say, just tell me what you have to say. Uh, and I'll be open and receive it, which is a bit risky because, you know, it, it can be a bit explosive <laughs> emotion. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th there's, there's a, lot to, a lot to consider there. So um, don't approach the unconscious with the assumption that it's all about type. Jung himself didn't do that, you know, because he, he would even talk about pure types. He would say... And you do see that clinically. You, you do, you, you do, do. You, you do, do come across that. And, and it, I think it explains <laughs> some of the, the strange uh, results you get on, on, these, yeah. on these structured tests where, where things are not clear. Yeah. Or they're so over -amped. There's like zero on T and it, the, 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 the top end of the score on feeling or, or whatever. And, you know, you, if you were of a, an inclination to see that as pathological, mm. you, you, and you'd be wrong, actually, to do that in most cases, then... Mm what you're not really understanding the situation at all yeah it just tells you that the test itself either isn't valid or there's something extremely interesting going on psychodynamically and rather than pathologize it it'd be better to find out what that is and learn and this is a you know an issue i have with things like big five as well i mean oh my god i mean that is just awful i mean if you have to have a scale that, that that's for neuroticism that's a disease <clears throat> That, that's a terrible suggestion. Well, we're all going to score something on that, aren't well, we, for a start? Young himself yeah. said, it, show me the man who isn't neurotic <clears throat> and I'll cure him. In other words, I'll make him neurotic because neurosis is normal. To not have neurosis is abnormal. There's something wrong with it. Um, and there's uh, many of the categories on Big Five is just so woolly and, and uh, lack articulation. I just simply couldn't put that into um, the context of working psychodynamically. You find a lot of clinical psychologists use it. But clinical psychology, I'm sorry, is not the best place to learn clinical skills. As a profession, historically, they've just been adjuncts to psychiatrists, they're very, very junior to them. Mm. And still now, all they do particularly <clears throat> is administer psychometric tests because they're basically academics who have been put in a situation and asked to make themselves useful, you know, uh, and then beyond the psychometric testing, they will do basic behavior modification, sometimes CBT. But both of those forms of therapy in a psychiatric unit are also done by nurses. Oh, yes, they are. Uh, done by uh, psychiatric social yeah, workers, as well. occup yeah, yeah. occupational therapists. So mm. there's nothing special about the clinical ability in a psychiatric setting. They just tend to control the use of psychometric tests. Mm which a psychiatrist might ask them to do as an adjunct to their diagnosis of someone, but yeah. they certainly have no power in a psychiatric setting over medication or anything yeah. like that. Well, psychiatrists um, themselves don't really care who performs the test no. as long as they're done, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. It's just it doesn't matter which no. profession does it. No, they, they can just then uh, mm. update the, uh, the case load and it looks like everybody's doing something. Yeah. Uh, and sadly, that's the way psychiatry works. And sadly, that, that's the way clinical psychology as a profession has evolved. They're basically academics who were asked to make themselves useful or wanted to make themselves useful in a psychiatric setting. Um, but they have no intrinsic training, certainly not in depth psychology at all. So they, they, yeah. they tend to overvalue psychometric <clears throat> tests because it justifies their existence. Whereas if you get um, a therapist, particularly actually ones who have to work in private practice, where market forces determine whether you're successful or not, you, you have to win on results. And uh, in our experience, if you work in the NHS and you're results orientated, you have to have in, hypnotherapy, good hypnotherapy integrated into your practice. And uh, with typology, um, yes, it is useful, but you have to know its limitations and work with them because even a limitation can be informative. Although for me, there's a cut-off point. The, the, the limitations of Big Five or the 16PF or the MMPI or any of them, oh, for God's sake, pointless. It just gets in the way of rapport. Rapport is the absolute essential that you must have to have any clinical effect. Because uh, transference is decided very, very quickly, very early on. And yeah, it does follow a waveform. Um, so if you don't, if you don't 
make it right at the beginning, it will be inevitable, as Jung and Freud and others discovered, that it will turn negative mm. because that's part of a person working through their problems with you, that they like you at first, and then they hate you, you know, um, and all the, all, all the negative stuff gets thrown onto you. And of course, Freud encouraged that, you know, he, uh, he thought it was so inevitable that you shouldn't try and be positive about it. You should just be completely blank. And then whatever neurotic problems the person has, they will then throw at you like a blank canvas. And that gets around the resistance that they might normally have, that the transference basically reveals what they will try and hide. But the transference then will reveal also the neurosis and the source of it, where all the maladaptations are. Whereas uh, Orthodox Jungians tend to want to work with the transference and be more honest and engaged in the process. Uh, the problem with that is it can delay it. And that's what the Freudians would say. They would say you're delaying the inevitable because this person will dump on you in time. Now there are reasons for that. If you have a long-term therapy, very long, as in Freudian uh, psychoanalysis and the Orthodox Jungian analytical psychology, you're talking about several times a week for several years. Well, anyone will get fed up with that. They'd get fed up with their therapist. And, they, and of course, you're going to sling stuff out then because someone has is, 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 is spent a huge amount of time and money mm. and energy on getting relatively nowhere over a long period of time. So in a sense, uh, the I'm going to call it this, unfortunately, the um, commercial utilization of transference and then the explanation to the patients that that's what it is, keeps them locked into a process this shouldn't take anything like as long as that, mm. you know? So there's the shadow of conventional analysis for you. So that kind of transference uh, can uh, be manufactured purely by the process. But there are uh, in-depth psychoanalytic and psychodynamic transferences that will occur in relatively brief therapy as well. Um, and when that happens, they are insisting themselves with such pressure that you have to deal with them. Do you agree on that one? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking yeah. about um, the expression that we sometimes use in therapy about well worried. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. People who aren't really suffering sufficiently mm. to to make any kind of real change. There's no real commitment to change, yeah. and very often they get picked up. Yes. Um, by the likes of uh, psychoanalysis and, and long term therapy, and they it almost becomes um, a form of status for them yes. to be able to say that they have a psychoanalyst that they go to every week yeah. or whatever yeah um and and they're, they're just the trap by but because they're not maybe suffering enough yeah yeah there's uh th there's no impetus to free themselves no. from that they'll, they'll, they'll be farmed they will it's a codependency yeah. trap and they will be farmed uh counselors are like that too yes. as well uh, and a lot of them just yeah. get off as voyeurs on the fact that someone else's life is very unpleasant and they're very comfortable yeah however one of the uh, the ways of dealing with that in yourself and in and in the inherent issues of a situation like like therapy is to be results orientated that, yes. that you have a duty to get this done uh, and work towards completing the process and not to be attached to outcomes for your own sense of self-esteem mm. as well That's well you need to know what that person wants as an outcome for themselves yeah absolutely and obviously you you, you can do that in a number of ways one of which um you were discussing earlier with shepherd's pendulum for yeah. example um but th th that has to be at the center of everything that you does, do because yeah. what you might want and, and what the patient wants might be completely two different things absolutely and if it's just that they come in and say well i want this symptom to disappear can you make that happen for me well that's your brief yeah it is. and that's what you work to yeah. Uh, and if they don't want to, to deepen it or to delve in and to deepen their insight, well, then you don't do it. No, no. Because it's not been asked for. No, no. And generally, they don't come in once you know about typology either. No, they don't. You, you'd, have to, um, you'd have to tell them that it existed <clears throat> and then justify its relevance. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, that's a form of selling, you know, more than anything else. Yes. So use it judiciously. And one way of doing that is not to propose a theory about it at all unless it's absolutely indicated then by all means of course because there is a justification for it um that being said i'm going to 
contradict myself now and say that we would routinely in an NHS setting give the Myers Briggs out. We just give it out and we would give them the results. We give them all, all, the, all the handouts necessary for them to understand the situation. Mm. And then if they wanted to discuss it further, we would with them, but we'd mm. give them information, which was yeah. important. We certainly wouldn't push it, and not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it, it is interesting. Uh, I think with Pauline's point about rapport too, but you use it very often, don't you, to gain rapport with people initially, you know, as a feeling type, say, yeah. we're thinking in, or, yes. or, or the type, you know, yes, that would yeah. be a positive use of it. it. It would. I mean, I was thinking, for example, about the gentleman we speak to the other day, yeah, um, yeah. who, um, Without, yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's not not just specific to him, yeah, yeah. but you see it a lot, where somebody might say, for example, say, say they were an ENFP um, and they, in a particular work situation, were seen as being controversial because they, they would be pushing new ideas all the time and um, people might sort of balk at the idea of that and, and, and find that difficult yeah. to, to kind of work with. Um, I was trying to say to him, well, the, the positive side of that, which at the time he wasn't emphasising, was that people who do that tend to act as a catalyst for change as well. So it's a positive use of it or positive, putting a positive spin on something that he'd previously thought as being a negative. So it, it can be useful in those ways where you're wanting to maybe give somebody some ego strength mm. and to encourage them to, to see the value in, in their own particular type. But then maybe further down the line, when, when they have that ego strength, you can look at the backside of that too. You can look at the downside mm of what it means to be that way yeah. so um it's it just it's always a case of how you use it isn't it and, and yeah uh, yeah what you're looking to achieve by yeah. using it yeah. as well it, it'll certainly give you an indication of where a person is at with respect to their adaptation and of course that's that's just intrinsically useful yeah uh, and of course that gives you an indication of where they might go with respect to further development but yeah. when, when you go in depth when you get off the surface typology becomes unimportant mm. But yes, yeah, certainly for, for rapport, for, for gaining contact with, yes. with, with someone to, yeah. and for them to have an initial understanding of their own compass, then you're yeah, absolutely great and yeah. uh, I'm all for it. Um, I, I tend to be concerned about it beyond that for obvious reasons and, and the reasons that, that, that we've discussed. Mm. Uh, and, I, and one of those myths to dispel, as we said before, is certainly the one that your unconscious is the opposite. It's not, if you do that, you create a mirage of your own ego and you project it backwards and if you project your ego back towards the self archetype as it's understood well actually you're asking for trouble to do to do that because it's a lot bigger than you are you know and, and don't interpret this on, on, on the, the terms of consciousness because if it gets upset with you it'll start to send you things that aren't very nice uh, and that, that can manifest as a, as a neurosis um, neuroses although they're not as severe as psychoses they can be very very debilitating so yeah, avoid all of that by treating your unconscious with respect and not assuming that it's a projection of your ego. See, people tend to do that psychosocially. You know, they project the self from the back out into the outside world when it settles on either a man of personality or a so-called wise old man archetype or mm. wise old woman or whatever. These are ego projections. And, you know, if you take it back from that, if you can, withdraw it, see it for what it is. The true self is not just psychology, it includes that. But the, the, the true self is an organismic thing that includes your, your entire being, bio, psycho, and socially. Uh, but the psychological part will take offense if you start to interpret it as some kind of you know, overamped ego projection. Yeah, just um, like to give a shout out to Laura Liss. Uh, thank you for permission to use your, use your question as part of the podcast. It's been really helpful. Um, and I hope it helps others. So thanks again, Laura. Thank you. Cheers.